very very thankful to dbt india alliance sara khalid and yukti for uh, making a liaison with uh, professor gagandeep kong and then requesting her to give this talk on our behalf i thank dbt india alliance and professor gagandeep kong for this uh, particular uh, lecture thank you very much professor kong Thank you very much, Dr. Shastri, and thanks to Arup and Lakshi, Swapnadi, and everybody for organizing this, as well as to Yuki and Sarah for setting this up. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the work that I do, as well as some features of my life, which I think may be of interest to students. Mostly I'm looking forward to the discussion that we have after the talk. So I hope that there will be questions that we can uh, base an interaction on. So the talk is titled, You Cannot Be What You Cannot See. And if you think about it, when I started my career, 40 years ago, did I think I was going to be where I am today? I certainly did not. That's why I'd like to share with you what I'm doing and then show you the path to how I got to be interested in the kinds of things that I work on and the partnerships that have allowed me to achieve whatever my group and I have done so far. So if you look at the kinds of problems that people approach, neurosciences is something that people are fascinated by. Cancer is in the news when you talk about research in biology to students. These are the ones that come as top areas that people think that they would want to solve problems. Diarrhea is not exactly glamorous, but diarrhea is a problem that has been with us for the ages. And some solutions are simple, some are complicated, but diarrhea continues to be with us. It's been estimated that if we look at how much water is released in a diarrheal stool in a day in the world, it equals the amount of water that goes over Victoria Falls in one minute. So it's estimated that in any given day, about 200 people in the world have diarrhea. And most of us know how to handle this. Most of us know that rehydration is important, making sure that you look after yourself during this time is important. But when it comes to children, then diarrhea becomes even more important. If you look at this picture of mothers and babies, most of the children are quite young. But if you look at the size of a child compared to the size of the mother, you can say that the child is about half or one third or a quarter the size of the mother. But if you look at weights of mothers and children, you find that the weight differential is much more. So if we take a six month old child, the six month old child might weigh about six kilos and the mother may weigh about 45, 50 kilos. So the differential between the mother and the child is one is to eight whereas the height differential will be a factor of two or three. This actually means that children have a very large surface area compared to their mothers. So when you lose fluid, the chances for dehydration become much, much more. So if you see this picture of a baby over here, you can see that someone has pinched the abdomen of this child, the stomach of the child, and you can see the mark of the fingers. The skin is raised. This is a sign of dehydration. When your skin does not go back quickly when it is pinched like this, it means that the child has become dehydrated. 
The reason for dehydration is diarrhea and among the causes of diarrhea, the most common cause is a virus that I work on, which is called rotavirus. Right now, we are familiar with another RNA virus, the SARS coronavirus type 2. Rotavirus is also an RNA virus, but unlike SARS coronavirus, where all of the genes are on one strand of RNA, in rotavirus, we have 11 strands of RNA or 11 genome segments that encode for the proteins of the virus. I have been studying this virus now for more than 20 years. And much of the work that I have done has been because I was able to work with the mothers and the children that you saw on the previous slide. We work in a slum area where there are lots and lots of children and families live very close together. This is in Velour, which is in southern India. And here we follow up children from the time that they are born till the time that they reach three or four years old when the danger of rotavirus dehydration is over. Based on the work that we did in this community where we visited every family twice a week to find out whether children had diarrhea or not, we also expanded to work in hospitals and we worked in hospitals that are shown in this map of India to see what proportion of the diarrhea that was coming into hospitals in young children was due to rotavirus gastroenteritis. Based on studies that we did and studies that other people did in Calcutta, it's been shown that rotavirus is the most important cause of severe diarrhea in young children in India. We were able to build what is called a burden of disease pyramid here, where essentially we found based on the studies that we had done in the community, studies that we had done in the hospital, that one in every two children in India under the age of two years would have a rotavirus diarrhea. One in eight children would be required visit or a clinic visit because of rotavirus diarrhea every year. One in 30 children would be hospitalized because of a rotavirus diarrhea. And at the time that we did the study, one in about 350 children would die because of a rotavirus diarrhea. Now, if we think that the deaths have come down quite significantly, but the diarrhea and OPD percentages did not change that much until we came up with a vaccine. In the work that we did, we were looking at how a vaccine would perform if it was made in India. And in order to do this, we had to follow up children for a long time and we compared our results to results of studies done in other parts of the world, in Central America and in Africa. And what we found in our study was that if children in India were infected with rotavirus, it did not protect them from severe rotavirus disease in the future the way it did in Latin America and in Africa. So based on that, we predicted that if rotavirus vaccines were used in India, they would not have the efficacy that vaccines that were used in the West would have. And this is a peculiar feature of vaccines that are given by mouth or given oral vaccines that you drink instead of having injected. There are many reasons for this, but even if a vaccine does not work very well, we estimated that if we had a vaccine that gave us what we estimated would happen, 50% efficacy, that would prevent about 30,000 deaths in India every year. 
we worked with many others on developing first one and then more recently a second rotavirus vaccine. This is a vaccine made by Bharat Biotech and what I'd like to point out is that what we had predicted, which was that vaccines would have about 50% efficacy was actually true. The vaccine was shown to have 55% efficacy against severe disease. Now, if we look at what happens in the world, we get lots of different kinds of vaccines. And because we get lots of vaccines, there are about 2.5 million children who would ordinarily die every year do not die because these diseases do not happen. But not all vaccines are the same. Some vaccines are very, very good and prevent a lot of deaths. Other vaccines are not so good and do not prevent quite so much disease and deaths. So if you can see here, diphtheria is a very good vaccine and the TB vaccines are not very good. Now we work on rotavirus vaccines and if you look at rotavirus vaccines, the global picture is one where the vaccine has about 70% efficacy. But within that 70% is hid hidden the fact that in low income countries, vaccines don't work very well. And in middle and high income countries, they work much better. So much of the work that we have done has been trying to figure out why vaccines don't work well in India. And there are many factors. You can look at genetics, gut functions, other infections, nutrition, immunity, any number of things that result in vaccines not working well in India. So many of the studies that we have done have focused on parts of this graph trying to figure out what really matters. So in the studies that we've done, we've looked at maternal antibodies, we've done breast milk antibodies, we've looked at other vaccines, nutrition, environmental entropathy, Everything that you can think of except stomach acid and proteases and host genetics and what have we found? We've actually failed. But because we have done so much work so carefully, we have figured out that if you do single interventions, that really does not result in a change in Indian children. So we need to be thinking about more complex ways of trying to improve the performance of vaccines. Now, it isn't just vaccines that are impacted by the environment in which our children live. If you look at this picture here, this girl is supposed to be where the green line is. That is normal height for age for the sling. But actually you can see that she is below the red line, which means that she is more than two standard deviations less than her height for age. And if you look at all the risk factors, she was born to a young mother. She was born low birth weight. She did not receive exclusive breastfeeding. She was stunted for a long time. But some of the other risk factors like not having a toilet or exposure to animals are not present in her environment. So if you look at her growth chart, you can understand that trying to understand the factors that have led to Tasleem being stunted is complicated. In addition to just doing epidemiological studies, we also do a lot of studies in the laboratory and we have looked at infections and inflammation in these children. And if you stratify based on socioeconomic status, you see that children from a low socioeconomic status have lots more infections and much higher inflammatory markers than children who live in a higher socioeconomic status setting. 
So this is the kind of work that I do. It's led us to understand that chronic malnutrition is a serious issue in India, not just for vaccines, but for many other things. In India, about two out of five children are chronically malnourished. In, there are 200 districts where it's close to 40%, but there is no district in the country that has less than 10% stunting. Stunting is much worse in the north and the center of the country. And if you look at the south, even in the south, in urban slum areas, you still have about 30% stunting. And the stunting is not just a failure of growth, it's also a failure of cognitive development because the median IQ in the slums is in the low normal range. So 89% puts children below normal. And if we look at persistently stunted children, their IQs are even lower than the median IQ that you see in slums. So living in this kind of very poor environment leads to children being stunted, leads to children having lower mental development, and also leads to vaccines not performing very well. So that has us thinking about where should we intervene? What is it that we can do to make a difference? And if you look through the life cycle, there are multiple places where we can intervene. For example, can we look at mothers and make sure that women are not malnourished and have appropriate weight gain so that babies are not born low birth weight? Can we look at weaning and make sure that children grow well and don't have frequent infections? Can we look at adolescents and see whether we can make sure that adolescent girls are at the right stage when they become pregnant so that their children are not impacted by their malnutrition. So there are multiple ways to think about this and we have now begun studies that will allow us to address these kinds of issues. Now coming to from that, I'd like to take you back to how I got to this point. I'm a railway child, which meant that my father got transferred quite frequently. And these are all the places that I lived before I came to Velour to go to medical college. So while I was with my parents, my father and my mother, who is a school teacher, uh, taught me that you needed to be flexible and adaptable. My father would spend a lot of time with me on my lessons where school was concerned. We built labs in our home. We worked through the summer on math problems. It was when you would learn with your parents in some ways when it isn't just for exams, it actually becomes fun. My mother taught me that there were no problems that could be thrown at me that I could not handle. She was an expert in logistics. We could pack up our house in three days and move on trains for months. It didn't matter as long as we were all together. It was possible for us to do any and everything. When I first applied for medical college, I did not get in. So I went to college in Delhi for a year doing a BSc in zoology and went to coaching classes, studied hard, and then got in in the second year to CMC Valor and many other places. This was the first time where everybody else was new. Because I had moved from place to place throughout my life, I was always the new person that had to make friends, had to adjust to new schools, and that allowed me to learn to deal with new situations. 
but in medical college it was fun to actually be with people who were also new to college being away from home learning to live on your own make friends i think is an incredible learning experience so as much as going to college i learned from the picnics the plays the helping out with extracurricular activities that happen all the time dealing with classes and teachers and exams is part of the whole but i think you can't focus just on that so one of the highlights of my life was actually making props for a musical called evita something i remember maybe more than i remember the classes that i attended when i finished medical college it, there was a question of what did i want to do i was thinking of ophthalmology i thought about psychiatry and then finally wound up doing an md in clinical microbiology clinical microbiology wasn't quite what i had expected i had read a book called microbe hunters where being a microbiologist was like being a detective and finding out solving new problems every day but in a hospital microbiology was very repetitive and i realized that i did not want to do this day in and day out so when i was offered a job that uh, was about doing research i thought maybe this is what i should be doing so that i can be encountering new problems all the time So I did my MBBS, my MD. I joined the faculty, and then decided that maybe doing a PhD also was a good thing. So I did my PhD also at CMC, and had two children during my PhD. So it was quite challenging because I used to go home, look after the children, and then come back to the lab at night to work on uh, my experiment. and my thesis it took me a long time but it got done and then i had the opportunity to take a study leave and go overseas i went first to london for one year where i decided that i needed some kind of street credibility as a clinical microbiologist and i wrote the membership of the royal college of pathology examination and then in the second year i went to the baylor college of medicine where for the first time in my life i found a mentor and this was dr mary estes she is a virologist she is still active and it's been 20 plus years and i continue to work with her what i learned from her was i walked into her lab i asked her for a job she said she would give it to me if i stayed 2 years i said i would stay one and then she said well okay i if that's the case that means you'll have to work twice as hard so i said okay i'm willing to do that but she sat me down and she said if you're going to be here it's equivalent to a post doctoral position and we will start with the question that you are going to address so we sat down and we defined the question that i was going to work on she chose one where she thought i would bring new skills and new understanding and where i would learn from the many things that her laboratory was doing so this kind of conceptualization that there needs to be growth not only of the labs work but also of the person doing the work was really remarkable so what did being outside india teach me it taught me about myself that i can manage many things that challenging myself is important and i that i am capable and as smart as most people even at the best institutions but it also taught me a lot about the work environment in india I realized that in India we don't praise enough we don't mentor enough 
we think small, we go from project to project. We don't have a long term strategy. We find it very hard to collaborate and to work with other people. And we are hierarchical. It really matters where you are in the pecking order. Seniors are treated with great respect, whether or not they necessarily deserve it because of their expertise. And consciously or unconsciously, we are very, very gender biased. So I had a choice then. I could stay in the UK. I could stay in the US and I could come back to India. I chose to come back, but realized very quickly that I didn't know it. I had decided to do an ambitious project, but I did not necessarily have the right kind of support to do it. So I had to learn from a laboratory to go into the field to supervise field workers. Working in a slum area was challenging. Uh, I had to manage two children who were just going to school. I had international collaborations. I had to be responsive to them. And then I just had wonderful women who helped me out everywhere. So whether it was friends or it was family, in the middle here is my husband's great aunt. She died two years ago at the age of 104. She was the first nursing superintendent of the Christian Medical College Bellow. And just listening to her stories and understanding how much she had gone through to be a nurse, to be the first nursing superintendent of, of CMC that was an Indian how she had handled it with such grace and determination was real learning for me. And then of course, this is Sashi Rekha Ramani, my first PhD student. Um, we learned together, we grew together, and now of course she is an assistant professor in the US and way smarter than I am. One of the things that happened during this time was that I was working on rotavirus when there were other rotavirus labs around and many of them did not like the findings that we were coming up with. So it was a very challenging time because people did not want us to participate in projects. People did not want us to come to meetings, speak about what we were doing to the extent that you know papers were being rejected from top end journals because people were writing to the editors and saying that this researcher me has no credibility it turned out finally that we were right and the others were wrong and we became accepted as part of the community I persisted, I built a group, we did the work that I described to you earlier and the work that we are doing now is not just to the point of having the rotavirus vaccines, but we've actually now had the vaccine in the program and we've been looking at the real world impact of rotavirus vaccines. And what we are finding is very interesting that the vaccine is working well in the community, but in the second year of life, the vaccine does not work so well in stunted children. So every time we do these studies and we do them carefully, we get some answers and then we have new questions. So now we need to think about what next. So what have I learned in 30 years of working um, in research? I think research and work does not happen in isolation. You need family and friends. You need to have that strong foundation. And you. it is the whole person that goes to work or to college or to learn anything. We should never be afraid to ask for help when we need it. It's surprising the number of people that want to help us to move forward. 
I think in research, we have to be curious. We have to ask questions and we have to find the answers. Usually we find that we can do it or we find that if we've really tried, it can't be done that way. If you believe that you can and will solve problems, that will happen if we stay with it long enough. Being persistent is very important and getting the right help is very important. I think it's very important to be ambitious and know that you can make a difference. So having come this far, I've decided that I'm going to be working in a new area and I'm going to work on mothers and children again. And I've chosen an area that it has very high maternal and infant mortality and I will be building out a program there. It's not very far from where you are. So I thought I would share that I'm going to be visiting the region fairly frequently from now on. I'm also going to be working in the laboratory trying to set up more human immunology studies. Some of that through natural infection, but also looking at what are called challenge studies where you deliberately induce an infection in a very controlled environment and then study response to infection or check whether vaccines are working or not. These are very ambitious projects because they are very difficult to set up and do because they must be done very, very safely and with absolute transparency. But this is what I hope to do in the future. To leave you at the end, I'd like to quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. I think many of us think that we don't have potential, that we are not as good as other people. I know that I felt like that at many points in my career. But one thing that I have understood is that if you believe in yourself, no one can take that away from you. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. So thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very Thank much, you much um, uh, it's excellent, excellent talk. I think that, uh, the kids would have learned how you uh, actually approach a problem, how one actually visualizes with all the constraints that one has, um, how does it actually get executed? And here you have um, a lady who's done it all, seen it all, and actually narrated it very lucidly to the students as to how one should take up the challenge and actually execute it. So I think it was a wonderful uh, exposition of the work you've done uh, and what you plan to do. And we have two lovely girls uh, who will take up all the questions with you, ma'am. So there's no gender bias on this, at least. Um, <laughs> I will request uh, the girls to take over and uh, there's a lot of questions that the students have asked and they'll be really excited to hear your viewpoint on that. Yeah, go ahead, Monty. Thank you so much, sir. On behalf of Director CSI NIST and the entire SRTP team, I would like to thank ma'am for your such a beautiful, insightful and elaborative lecture. It was indeed really inspiring for all of us and we are honored to hear you, ma'am. So ma'am, there are a lot of questions as well as appreciation comments. So with your permission, we would like to begin the question and answer session. Should be, ma'am? Sure, please go ahead. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, ma'am, the first question is from Azim Khan. What is the RNA based vaccine that is being touted as the most effective one by Oxford University? OK, so the vaccine that Oxford is making is actually a vectored vaccine. It's also focused on the spike protein of um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. The vaccine has the gene for making the spike protein in an adenovector that is adenovirus vector that is 
derived from chimpanzees. The reason that you use a chimpanzee adenovirus is because humans will not have antibodies to that adenovirus vector. Once the vector gets in, it gets inside cells. It's a non-replicating vector. It allows for the infected cells to make the spike protein and then the body responds to the released spike protein with its immune response. Both uh, cellular and humoral immunity are generated. I think it's not possible to say right now that this is an effective vaccine for humans. That data will come from efficacy trials. But all the signs are good. The vaccine is safe. It is immunogenic. And in monkeys, it has been shown to prevent disease. Thank you so much, ma'am. The next question is from Sneha. Does the individual gut flora play a vital role in uneasiness of the gut? Yes, it does. Um, I actually think that if your gut is happy and healthy, the rest of your body is also likely to be happy and healthy. You know that if you have diarrhea or if your gut is upset, you're always miserable. And more and more what we are finding out is that the organisms that are in the gut have a lot of functional characteristics and have different kinds of distributions in different states. So in inflammatory bowel disease, you'll have organisms that are more pro-inflammatory. So there is a lot of discussion now about whether it is possible to modify the gut flora and treat a number of diseases, not just those that are related to the gut, but diseases in other locations as well through modification of gut flora. These are challenging, but there are a number of groups and companies that are working on these areas. We already have a start to this with people using probiotics with yogurt, with many other things that people are already using in an attempt to modify gut flora. What happens with most of these is that while you are taking that probiotic, you can see the probiotic in the gut and you get some beneficial effects, but it's not something that leads to long-term colonization with that pathogen. So the problem we have to solve is how do we get the good bacteria to stay for a long time? Thank you, ma'am. The next question is that, uh, how can I uh, still become a biomedical research scientist if I didn't take biology in my 12th standard and college? Some of the best biologists I know are IIT engineers. So there is nothing stopping you from changing tracks once you get into research. So biomedicine has many components. I know people from a physics background, people from a pure mathematics background. Infectious disease modeling is done mostly by physicists and mathematicians that understand the behavior of systems. Similarly, engineers play a large role in medicine. Every X-ray machine, CT scanner that you built has been built by an engineer, not by a doctor. So there are many ways in which people without a biology background in class 12 can definitely get into biomedical areas of research in the future. Thank you so much, ma'am. The next question is, what are your thoughts on the scientist stereotype? Is it important for scientists to break such stereotypes? If yes, how have you done it, ma'am? So I think it depends on what your perception of a scientist is. If it's the mad genius with frizzy hair that ignores the rest of the world, um, I think you will find that most scientists really aren't like that. It, scientists are people too, right? 
and it is a question of how you handle your profession and the world. I think it's important for everybody to have a balance to what you do, work hard, but also take time out to enjoy yourself, spend time with friends, you know, get enough exercise. That's what keeps you whole and sane. Thank you, ma'am. And the next question is from Avishek Chatter. Does 41 murine breast cancer cell line express any identified tumor antigen to function as a therapeutic agent for vaccine development? This is not a question that I can answer because I don't know. So I am sure it would be possible to find out and uh, you may have the answer more than I do. Okay, ma'am. The next question uh, is from R.T. Kansara. What is the common cause of infection by rotavirus? The rotavirus is a virus that is ubiquitous in the environment and it is quite easily acquired. Uh, that's why young children get rotavirus and when they get it, mostly they get diarrhea. Rotavirus also can circulate in the bloodstream and can replicate in multiple organs, but it is not usually a cause of many things outside the gut. One of the questions is whether rotavirus causes seizures because it has been known that after rotavirus vaccines were introduced, the incidence of seizures in some parts of the world has gone down. So um, the nice thing about rotavirus is that repeated infections lead to immunity. So adults usually do not get rotavirus disease. Thank you so much, ma'am. The next question is, do you think herd immunity will play a role in our country in order to reduce the gastric issues? Um, so herd immunity has been shown to play out in other parts of the world. What we've seen there is that you immunize the birth cohort but actually you see less diarrhea in the parents of the children who were immunized and you see less diarrhea in the grandparents of the children who were immunized. So protection, there is less circulation of virus in the community. So unvaccinated members of the community are protected. This is true for most vaccines. It is a question of where herd immunity, at what level, it will be achieved. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is that, uh, what motivated you to become a researcher and not practice medicine? So I, I don't like doing the same thing every day. So when you are a doctor that sees patients, you know, the first two years, three years, five years, 10 years, you know, you will, after a while, you start seeing the same patterns again and again. So you're waiting for the occasional outlier patient that becomes an interesting problem to solve. In research, I have the advantage of always being able to define the questions that I'm interested in and then think about ways to answer them. So I find that a lot more fun than not knowing which kinds of patients I'm going to see on a particular day. Thank you, ma'am. So the next question is, does the normal flora of the body has a crucial role on the mechanism of vaccine? That is a really, really good question. And the answer is we don't know. We think so, we think it matters, but actually we don't really know. 
we know that the microflora trains our immune system. Whether it is in the mouth or in the gut or on the skin, the fact that we encounter microorganisms all the time allows our immune system to develop. So if we were to take some bacteria, viruses, fungi out, how would our system develop? We don't have answers to that right now. But these are fascinating areas to think about, and it may be possible for us to figure out if we added this extra microorganism that might lead to a better immune response for one or more vaccines. So it's a fascinating area to work in, and I hope some of you will take it up. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is from RC Agrawal. Finding the right mentor and maintaining a good mentor-mentee relationship seems to be important for a career in STEM. How do we know that we have chosen the right mentor? I think you'll figure it out pretty quickly. You have to have a relationship with your mentor where you feel like you're always being challenged, but you also feel like you are being supported to grow. If you are challenged too much without the support, that is not a good relationship to have. That's just, you know, literally throwing you off the deep end without throwing you a uh, lifeline, right? So you need that challenge because without it, you won't grow, but you also need the support. If in the first six months you're finding that you are not growing, then your mentor is not doing their job. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is from Kirandeep Kaur. When looking at factors responsible for less efficacy of vaccine, how the attributes like stunted growth and malnutrition affecting it, is it genome level or some sort of interaction with the vaccine that's leading to hindrance in its function? So again, I think that's an outstanding question. And what we are trying to do is break it down into its component parts. Is it because effectively the vaccine inoculum is lowered by interactions with other organisms or molecules? Or is it because the body itself is affected in some way and made to respond less well? The immune response is not as good as it, it would otherwise be. So we are trying to address these questions. The problem is that you can address questions in model systems. And then when you actually go to humans, you are not sure about how to measure whether what you found in a model system is true in humans or not. We are very complicated. And I hope that in the future, it will be possible for us to address these issues. So right now people are trying to develop a mouse where the mouse is uh, colonized with human microflora taken from people who have responded to vaccine and who have not responded to vaccine to try and understand which component is really being affected. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is from Dr. Malaj and Kumar. Uh, could computational drug modeling solve COVID issue? I don't know about solve, but certainly take us a few steps further along. What you're looking at from drug modeling is to figure out where you can interrupt a critical pathway to pathogenesis. So what does the virus do to the host? What are the pathways that are used? If you identify the pathways and find a way to interrupt those interactions, then you might be able to prevent either infection or disease. This can be done by modeling studies, but with modeling studies, you will have many potential targets that you could be looking at. 
Now, finding the small molecules for those targets is obviously important. But then you need to see whether these can actually be therapies or not, because you have to be looking at safety. You have to be looking at the amount required for an appropriate interaction. So the whole admit component needs to be addressed. Thank you so much, ma'am, for patiently answering all the questions. We just have a few more questions. So, ma'am, if you would like permit us us to ask should we proceed with the question and answer session more please go ahead thank you so much ma'am so the next question is did you face failures in your vaccine research and how did you overcome them ma'am everything you know practically everything i've done has failed so when i tried to replicate the cohort studies from mexico and guinea bissau and they didn't work like that. We had different findings. I tried to look at immune responses in vaccinated children, and the children did not have the high levels of response that we were looking at. We tried to do all kinds of interventions to improve immune response in the children, and none of the ones that we have tried so far have worked. So if there have been successes, it's been that I was part of a team that developed one and then two rotavirus vaccines that are now being used in the program. So failure is, you know, if, if you don't fail, you haven't been ambitious enough. If you constantly succeed, you are not challenging yourself enough. You learn way more from failing, then you learn from succeeding all the time. So I think failures are very valuable. Failures show that you are being ambitious, that you're really trying something that other people have not tried before. If you follow the straight, safe path, then you're not really advancing science. You're not going to be leading to new you know, the work you do is not going to lead to new insights. So we should set ourselves up to fail as much as possible. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is that how, how was your time and experience as a PhD student? Miserable. <laughs> So I mentioned that I did my PhD when I had a full time job as faculty. I had two children under the age of five. My PhD took me six years. My PhD topic was changed six times. Finally, I think somewhere in my fifth year, I said I really have to sort this out for myself. I went to the Indian Institute of Science and talked to multiple scientists there and then came up with an experimental plan, came back home and executed that plan because my guide was giving me something new every day. And some of it was relevant, some of it was not relevant. I couldn't see a story developing. So finally, I just gave up and did it myself. And that resulted in my being able to complete the PhD. Otherwise, I would still be doing it. Thank you so much, ma'am. So the last question is from Sneha. What is your constant support of motivation? I think it's my family and my friends. So I always felt like as much as I believe in myself, they also believe in me. And if so many people believe that I can do amazing things, then obviously I can do amazing things. So I hope that my group, my students and I will continue to take on big and ambitious projects and try and solve problems that are important for India. That's what we've done over the last 20 years, and I hope that we will continue to do that. Thank you so much, ma'am, for nicely responding to all the queries. Listening to you was an honor for all of us, and 
you are really an inspiration for all of us, ma'am. Your uh, years of research and your depth of understanding this uh, uh, subject and the way you have uh, explained everything in such an interesting manner has made this session so intriguing, ma'am. There are lots of appreciation and uh, really we are honored to listen to you and we hope we will be able to listen to you further. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Now I hand over the session to Dr. Lucky's duty to propose the word of thanks. And good afternoon, ma'am, and good afternoon to all the participants. On behalf of the director, CSIR NIST, Dr. Sastri, the entire CSIR SRTP team, and on my personal behalf, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to our eminent speaker, Professor Gagangib Khan, for accepting our request to deliver a lecture today under this program. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your interesting and very inspiring talk on you cannot be what you cannot see. Thank you for sharing with us your valuable findings and experiences in the extraordinary work you have done on diarrheal diseases and the development of rotavirus vaccine. It was very pleasant to know about your life's experiences, particularly how you took the stride in shaping your career journey. I must say that this was one of the very unique sessions we've had under this series and as striking and unconventional as the title of the talk was, I think your views on uh, research and researchers life, how to tackle challenges, failures and realize your ambitions were indeed very motivational and refreshing. I'm sure your lecture has definitely ignited the young minds and we are indeed grateful to you ma'am for sparing time from your busy schedule to be with us today and actively participating throughout this session. I'm also very thankful to DBD India Alliance team, Dr. Sara and Dr. Yukti for connecting us with you and making this possible. I would also like to thank our director, Dr. Sastri, for his consistent encouragement and guidance and Professor Alok Dhawan, director CSI IITR for your excellent support and role throughout this summer training program. Last but not the least, thanks to all the participants for joining us in today's session. Thank you and Jai Hind. The session ends here. Thank you. Bye-bye.